have the most difficult names. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the title is on the board, so go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation to this great week. Um, it's my pleasure to talk about this uh, master's project of my student, Rosa Winter. Um, and I immediately have to apologize, this is not about rational points. Um, however, I think it's something that uh, many, or at least hopefully some of you will be interested in. Um, and during the week we've been going uh, from the relatively easy varieties, rationally connected to K3 services, to the last talk, uh, basically everything. Um, so I want to go back to the easy ones um, and talk about just the Fano services, the Del Pezzo services. Um, and not only that, I will do this over algebraically closed fields. Um, so you might think that you know everything about Del Pezzo services over algebraically closed fields. So um, if I have any goal this hour, it is to show you that you didn't. Um, and, well, the only place where you didn't really, perhaps, was the, those of degree one. Um, but I'll start um, with the story um, a little easier, namely, oh, not too fast. Um, I want to start with cubic surfaces. So Del Pezzo surfaces of degree three, but that will come up in a bit. So if you have a smooth cubic surface over a field, um, there might be some visible. Um, they contain 27 lines. And the question is, how many of those lines can go through one point? And whenever I say that sentence, uh, the order of the quantifiers that I mean is that there exists a point that all of them go through, not that they all go through some point and different ones. Um, and the proof of that is very easy, because if you have a point and a line through it, um, that line will be in the, uh, in a tangent plane to that surface. Um, and that means that if you have several lines going through one point, they will all be in the hyperplane section that you get by intersecting with the, the tangent plane, and that will be, give you a cubic curve, and if that consists of some lines, it's going to be three lines, and either, usually, they will just be in a configuration on the right, um, where there is no point that all three of them go through, but sometimes um, they might all three go through that same point. Um, Okay, so that's a possibility. So the uh, maximum is three. Um, an Eckert point is a point that is special in that sense, in the sense that it lies on three of these 27 lines. So here's an example. If you write down a very explicit surface, uh, the Fermat surface, um, you can write down some of the lines. If you stare at this long enough, you will see that these are indeed describing some lines, nine lines given by just setting the sum of two of these monomials equal to zero and the sum of the other two also. And there's a point that's one of the Eckert points. And if you understand that one, you'll also be able to find 17 other ones. There's 18 Eckert points on this surface. Um, and well, these special ten, uh, uh, tangent planes that intersect the surface in three lines, those are called the, the tritangent planes. Um, there's 45 of them. Most of them intersect the surface in a configuration of three lines that was on the right. Um, but that does mean that 45 is an upper bound for the number of Eckert points that you can have. And indeed, um, in characteristic two, you can have 45 of these points on a cubic surface. But in general, 18, uh, so in general meaning outside characteristic two, 18 is the upper bound. And this uh, example that you just saw the Fermat surface um, actually attains that upper bound. Um, now, another way to look at this, um, less geometric perhaps, is by realizing that a cubic surface is just, um, well, at least over the algebraic closure, which is what we're doing anyway, because these are geometric questions. Um, it's isomorphic to the blow up of P2 in six points. And when you do that, um, oh, if you do it slowly at least, Um, then you know exactly what the uh, canonical divisor is. The canonical divisor on a hypersurface in Pn of the uh, hypersurface degree D on Pn. Um, I'm going to stand here. It's annoying to the camera, but then I can see it here better. There, um, the canonical divisor is minus n 
minus one plus d times a hyperplane, so indeed that's going to be minus a hyperplane. Um, so minus the canonical divisor will be linearly equivalent to a hyperplane. Um, and that means that um, these lines um, correspond exactly with the classes in the Picard group that have self-intersection minus one and that intersect. Well, they're lines, so they degree one, they intersect the hyperplane uh, class um, with intersection number one. And if you blow up, then you know exactly what happens with the Picard group. Um, if you press this thing, you don't know exactly what happens, but um, the Picard group is going to, you start off with just one copy of Z for the line in P2, and every time you blow up a point, you get a copy of the, well, you get an extra copy of Z, namely Z times the exceptional curve there, um, which means that we know exactly what the Picard group is, and we also know exactly what the intersection pairing is. L squared is one, L times one of these EIs is zero, um, and the EI times EJ is also zero unless I is equal to J, in which case the self-intersection EI squared is minus one. So you know exactly what you have, and you want those elements that have self-intersection minus one and that intersect the anti-canonical divisor with uh, intersection number one. And that determines exactly which elements you want. And you can describe them as follows. Um, they are the EIs themselves, but also the classes L minus EI minus EJ. Those correspond to lines through two points. Well, the strict transfer of them on the blow up and 2L minus um, all of the EIs except for one. So, and those are exactly the strict transforms of the conics through five of the six points. Um, and that is exactly a total of 27. Um, now, if you want to understand how they intersect each other, you can draw a graph. Um, that is not the graph. That is the complement of the graph, but it's much more uh, well known, so it's easier to find a picture of. Um, so if you, instead of the, yeah, so in this picture, the Shafley graph, each point is connected to 16 of the uh, other 26 points. And that means that the complement, uh, every point is exactly uh, connected to 10. And indeed, the 27 lines each intersects 10 other lines. And these 10 other lines are actually, um, partitioned in five partitions, in five pairs that intersect each other again, which means that on every line, what's the maximum number of Eckhart points? Well, on every line, there's, in general, 10 intersection points, but they can, if you're lucky, every pair coincides and gives you an Eckhart point. So on each of the 27 lines, you might have at most five Eckhart points but now you have to divide by three because each point you've counted three times. So there's at most 45 points, and that's exactly the last um, argument there. That's the same 45 as we've seen before. Um, so that's the cubic surfaces. That was just a, a start, a warm-up. Um, now we're going to Del Pizzo surfaces. It will be still a little bit of a warm-up because we'll first do degree two. Um, but what is a Del Pezzo surface? Most of you will already know, but it's um, a surface um, that's geometrically integral, smooth, projective, and such that the anti-canonical divisor is ample. In other words, there exists some embedding into some projective space um, where um, some positive multiple of minus the canon canonical divisor um, is linearly equivalent with the hyperplane section. And the degree, by definition, is the self-intersection of the canonical divisor. And if A is one, that corresponds exactly with the degree of the model in the PN. Um, so the examples, one of them is the, what we just saw, a cubic surface, where A is one and the degree is indeed three. And, but you can also look at double covers of P2 that are ramified over a smooth quartic. And they have degree two. Um, and here's the reason why you might have thought that you knew everything about Del Pezzo surfaces over algebraically closed fields because they are just either P1 cross P1 or P2 blown up with a bunch of points where a bunch is at most eight and for a cubic you've blown up six points. Um, and indeed, you do know everything in the sense that you know exactly which lines there are and which intersect. And if you think of a configuration 
and the com combinatorics of the lines on a del Pezzo surface, um, meaning which lines do we have and what is the graph on the lines, well, then you don't know everything about the combinatorics of del Pezzo surface, or the lines on del Pezzo surface. But if you think of the combinatorics as meaning the lines together with the intersection points and which uh, lines go through which intersection points, then it's not completely determined because sometimes three lines intersect in a triangle, sometimes they go through one point, they're concurrent. Um, so we didn't know everything yet. For the cubic surfaces, we did. Um, and for degree four, we also know quite a bit. We know um, that the, the maximum is four. We'll get to that in a bit because let's first talk about these del Pezzo surfaces. The points that you blow up, they're points in general position. And in general position means something very specific. It means that no three lie on a line, no six lie on a conic, and no eight lie on a singular cubic where that singularity is one of the eight points. And that's exactly what it means to be in general position. Um, because that's exactly what it means for the blow up to uh, have uh, uh, a canonical visor of which, well, minus of which is ample. Um, but in the sense of the cubic surfaces, um, well, or in, in, in general, even if they're in general position, that position might still be special enough that some of the lines go through one point, more than two. Um, and that's what we want to understand. Um, so um, what are the minus one curves if you blow it up? Well, for the degree three, we already saw it, it was the lines through two points, it was the conics through th five of them, and the uh, cubics through seven of them, and singular at one of those. Um, and there's also the quartics through eight points that, is, that are singular at three of those eight, the quintics through eight points that are singular at six of them, and even sextics through the eight points um, with singularities at all eight, but a triple point even at one of them, um, those all give you in the strict transform minus one curves. Um, and here's the number of them that you get in the various degrees, or I should say, the number of points that you blow up, that's R. And we're going to look at the case, well, later we'll look at the case where R is equal to eight, namely where the degree of the del Pezzo surface is one. But before we do that, um, let's go to the del Pezzo surface of degree two. As I said, they were the, they're double covers of P2 ramified, um, uh, ramified over a, uh, a quarter curve. Um, and that quarter curve, has exactly 28 bitangent lines, and these bitangent lines pull back, well, bitangent lines pull back to um, a curve on the double cover of two components. Usually, a line will just pull back to um, an irreducible curve, but those 28 bitangent lines will pull back to two components, and these two components will ex intersect each other exactly at the two points where the line in P2 intersects the, cur the ramification curve, the, the branch curve um, of degree four, right? In general, the number of uh, intersection points will be four, but because it's a bitangent line, there will be exactly two points where they intersect doubly. Um, okay, that means that each of these minus one curves, which I'll call lines, um, comes with a partner namely the one that's the other component of the pullback of uh, the line, one of those uh, 28 bitangent lines. Um, and also, if you have, um, so here's some, some facts that I can mention about that. So um, each line, um, well, each of the bitangent lines intersects each of the other 27 bitangent lines in P2. And then that means that um, if you look at the components that are above it, each component, well, the two components together will intersect the two other components above another bitangent line in exactly two points. And one component will intersect one of the other two, and the other one will intersect the other. And which also means that if you have a line, a minus one curve, and it inter intersects another minus one curve, then its partner 
the partner of the first one, will not. Um, so that means we know, we understand a lot about the, the, the intersection numbers. We understand everything about the intersection numbers. Um, and here, again, similar to what we did before, you can give an upper bound for, um, well, not only the number uh, of lines, the maximum, I guess I'm going a little bit too fast. The first argument says that, um, uh, yeah, no, that's right. So the, the interesting thing is if I have one minus one curve, if I blow it down, I get a cubic surface. And on a cubic surface, I had exactly 27 minus one curves. Those correspond to 27 minus one curves on the Del Pezzo surface of degree two that did not intersect the one that I blow, blew down. But because of this involution, all the partners of the 27 that did not intersect it it gives me 27 that do. And the graph on the ones that do is exactly the same. Oh yeah, I'm on the, the graph, just the subgraph on the 27 that do is exactly this uh, isomorphic to the graph on the 27 that don't, um, which is exactly the minus one curves on a cubic surface. So if I take one, um, now, if I want to know how many points can go through, how many lines can go through one point, well, there has to be at least one. And all the other ones, they come uh, from the 27 lines on a cubic surface, and there was at most three. So in total, I can have at most four. So there's already uh, a very combinatorial argument that the maximum number of points, maximum number of lines that can go through one point is four on a the Petzl service degree two. You can also give a very nice geometric argument uh, like Tony and Damiano and uh, Mario Silvelasco have done in a paper. Um, but this already tells you from the graph that you have at most four lines going through one point. And how many of these Eckert points can you have? Generalized Eckert points, I should say now. Um, well, you can do s exactly the same thing. You have 56 lines. How many Eckert points can you have on each one of them? Well, there's one line, it intersects 27 other lines, so that's going to normally give 27 intersection points on this line. But a generalized Eckert point will need three of them to come together. So that's 27 divided by three, that's at most nine generalized Eckert point on each, li each line. Um, and I divide by four minus one because of the four you already have one. Um, but then you have to divide it by four still because each Eckert point you've counted four times now. And that's at most 126. Um, and indeed, over F9 and characteristic three, you can attain this bound. Um, and several people in the audience here will recognize that surface. Um, I don't actually know what the maximum is outside uh, characteristic three. Um, but I don't know if that's just because I haven't looked uh, hard enough. And if I don't know if that's known. Um, but I don't know it. Um, now, if we want to do the same thing for uh, Del Pesto service of degree one, we have to understand this graph on the lines, where the, the lines are the vertices and they uh, are connected if they intersect each other, um, just like we've seen before. Um, these graphs well, the one you saw was for 27, or actually the complement of the one for 27. That already looked pretty big. The one for degree two, I didn't even show, but that has 56 vertices. For degree one, it has 240 vertices. It's pretty big, and if you want to do any computations or anything with it, um, it's nice to understand the automorphism group of this thing. And we know the automorphism group, and we have for a long time. So let X indeed be the blow up of P2 in a bunch of points, where now a bunch is between six and eight. Um, and let E, curly E, be the, the set of classes corresponding to these minus one curves, the lines. Um, so that means that uh, set E has 27, 56, or 240 elements. Um, then in the Picard group of X, um, these 27, 56, or 250 elements, they lie in a hyperplane given by the fixed intersection with the anti-canonical divisor being one. Um, 
And I thought I had it down how to press, but apparently it's pretty tricky still. Um, so now it's good that I have a pointer. Here I have the full automorphism group of the Picard group. And inside it, I have only those automorphisms that actually fix the canonical divisor. Um, No, here I mean, well, so here I don't. This is just really as a lattice. Um, but that's indeed not the right thing to look at. So I'm looking at the, the, the subgroup of those. But, uh, sorry. Um, no, you're right. Um, I mean uh, the ones that do preserve the intersection pairing also. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, I'm looking now at those, yeah, so the, the, that's why, huh, good question. I anticipated it, but forgot about it. This is why the, the word lettuce is red. Um, so I'm looking at those, so the automorphism group of the lattice pick X, and I'm looking only at those that fix the canonical divisor. Um, so that goes uh, isomorphically to the automorphisms of the lattice that I get if I take the orthogonal complement of the canonical divisor. And that, in fact, is isomorphic to the, the value group of the standard classical root lattice ER. So that's what I wrote here, E6, E7, E8 are the classical root lattices, which are exactly the lattices consisting of those elements, not of self-intersection minus one, but of self-intersection minus two. Um, maybe normally you would say two, but here there's a minus extra. Um, and it is also isomorphic to the group of those permutations of just the 27, 56, or 240 minus one curves that preserve the intersection pairing. And that group is also isomorphic to the, um, the automorphism group of the, of the graph if you take the weighted graph with the intersection multiplicity indicating the weight of the, um, the, e the edge connecting to intersecting minus one curves. And that group I'm going to call GR. So this GR is also isomorphic to this, this VI group. Um, and here's the number of elements. They're pretty big. And what Manin already knew, and perhaps already many people before, is that this group acts transitively on the elements on, the, on these minus one curves. Um, but we wa will want to understand much more about the, the action on, um, on this set. Um, but before we do, uh, for the double covers of P2 ramified over a smooth quartic, so that the Petzl surface of degree two, um, there each minus one curve had a, a partner because you had an involution. The same thing works on the Petzl surface of degree one, so let me tell you about that. If I have an the Petzl surface of degree one, it is um, a double cover, not of B2, but of uh, a singular cone ramified along a degree six curve on that cone, namely a curve that you get by intersecting the singular cone with a degree three surface in the P3 that the cone lies in. Um, and that means that, uh, well, so now what is going to, the, the minus one curves on the, the Petzl surface of degree one, they're going to be components of certain curves on the cone that you pull back to the double cover. Namely, they're going to be the pullback of um, tri-tangent planes to this degree six curve. So the, uh, in general, if you take any plane and you intersect it with this um, curve of degree six, you get six intersection points. Um, and if they are three points where the intersection is double, so you actually get a tri-tangent plane, then those are the ones that pull back to, um, to two components, namely minus one curves. Okay, I slightly light there because you do want to make sure that the tri-tangent plane isn't so degenerate that it actually goes through the, uh, the vertex of the cone. Um, but outside those, of which there are infinitely many, there's t exactly 120. Um, 
and they pull back to the 240 minus one curves on the del Pezzo surface of degree one, each one with a partner, and each one intersects its partner with multiplicity three, namely exactly the three intersection points um, on the ramification curve. And here's some facts that are completely trivial, but that I will use um, the whole time. So if you have any two of these partnered minus one curves, they intersect, as I said, in three points, namely exactly on the branch curve, on the ramification curve. Um, and if you have a point on a ramification curve and you have a minus one curve going through it, then automatically its partner will also go through it. Um, and moreover, just as before, for the degree two, you could tell exactly if the if minus one curves intersects another one with multiplicity one, then its partner will intersect it with multiplicity zero. Um, here, something very similar happens. Um, a minus one curve and its partner together are the pullback of one of these hyperplane sections on the cone and are together, the sum of them, is linearly equivalent with minus two times the canonical of Heiser because of that. And it means that together they intersect any other minus one curve with multiplicity two. So if you know the intersection number of E with another one, you also know the intersection number of its partner with that thing. Um, and that's very useful. Um, and here is a little graph of, of how they intersect. So if I start with one point E1, um, it has self-intersection minus one. That's what's indicated here. There's exactly one element with which it has self-intersection three, namely its partner. Um, also, exactly because of the same reasoning as before, if you blow it down, you get a top of service of degree two. There's 56 of them there. So there's 56 with which it has self uh, which, it, which it has intersection zero. And if you take all their partners, then you will get 56 of them with which E1 intersects with multiplicity two. And all the other ones, and there's 126 left, they will intersect E1 with multiplicity one. Um, and if you have an element here, well, its partner will also be in here. And this picture also indicates that if you have one element in here, then it intersects uh, zero elements of these z same 126 with multiplicity zero and 60, uh, sorry, no. It intersects thir 32 of them with multiplicity zero and 60 of them with multiplicity one. Um, so there's a couple of intersection numbers about this huge graph that tells you at least something. Um, so here's another fact. The big automorphism group acts transitively not just on the element on the set itself, the 240, but on sequences of eight elements that all intersect each other with multiplicity zero. And what you should think of, of those uh, is that, for, so one element in that set is exactly the eight exceptional curves that you got by blowing up the points that you blew up in P2. But apparently this means that if you have any eight of the 250, 340 minus one curves that intersect each other with multiplicity zero, then you can blow them down and in another way, so you get, you see the same surface as a blow up in another way from another P2, where these eight become the eight exceptional curves above the eight points that you blew down there. Uh, that you blew up. Um, and also, um, well, so for every element in U, you can blow them down, and you get then the pullback of a line in this other uh, P2 that you blow up, um, such that you know exactly what the minus the canonical divisor is. And, well, G acts faithfully on the Picard group of X, meaning that if you have a non-identity uh, non element of the automorphism group, it permutes something in the Picard group. And that means that it acts freely on U, meaning that if I have 
a non-identity element of the automorphism group, um, it will move every element of U. Because if I have, suppose I have an element, a non-identity element G of the automorphism group, and any, any element of U, so eight of these um, minus one curves, if G fixes all eight, well, together with the canonical divisor, which is also fixed, they generate the whole Picard group. So they would fix the whole Picard group. Um, and therefore, there's a contradiction because G was actually, uh, then would be the identity. So that means that G acts freely on U. It also, we already knew, acts transitively on U. So actually, U has as many elements as G, which was a large number that you've seen before that I don't know by heart. Um, so now we know a little bit more about the action. We'll see even more about it. Um, and that will help us try to understand the maximal number of minus one curves that at least intersect each other, all of them. Because if you're going to have uh, eight minus one curves all intersecting each other in one point, well, they'll all intersect each other. So you need, in this graph, a complete sub subgraph. And well, if you have a complete subgraph, you still don't know if those lines will actually go through one point, because as in the cubic surface case, they could either intersect as a triangle or actually go through one point. Um, but at least you need them to all intersect each other. Um, now, at this point, if you're cynical, you could say, OK, you can skip the, the next few slides that you don't know yet, because this is just about one graph and one automorphism group. Um, it's a, anything you want to do with this graph is, is a finite computation. It's just one graph. Um, so if you want, you can just count all the maximal um, cliques, the maximal complete subgraphs in the graph. And well, it might take you a while or it might take a computer a while, but then you know you've done it once and it's just, you said you could do it in a deserted island if you had uh, enough time and nothing else to do. Um, and in fact, you could also then check if the group, the automorphism group, acts transitively, for instance, on those maximal complete subgraphs. Because, well, the group was pretty big, um, so you'd need quite a bit of time, you might think, and you still do, but you could at least reduce it a bit. Because if you want to know the orbit under such a huge group, um, well, that orbit could be really big. But if it's, if it's really big, then the stabilizer is small. So then you just need to show that the stabilizer is small. If it's really small, well, then it's also easy. You just compute a bunch of them. And now for, every gen for a set of generators of the group, you show that you don't get anything anymore. So then you can also show it. Um, it's still quite a bit of work. And especially counting the number of maximal subgraphs is, is quite a bit of work, um, even before you start acting on it. Um, but of course, this is not very satisfying, so I'm going to show you some slides anyway. Um, so I will not do, so the, the thesis of Rosa contains uh, a whole chapter of all kinds of sets that this group acts transitively on. Um, I'm not going to show all of them, because here I'll just do a sketch. Um, but uh, just to show you the idea of some of the arguments, I will show some sets that some types of uh, some, some sets in terms of these gr this graph that the automorphism group acts transitively on. So for, here's three sets, um, and maybe I should draw some pictures. So the first one is just pairs of minus one curves that do not intersect each other. Um, so that's two lines for V1. Or if you think in terms of the, the graph, there are two vertices corresponding to these two lines that are not connected because they don't intersect. Um, for V2, and maybe I'll call these actually what they are here, E1 and E2. For V2, I'm looking at triples of minus one curves um, in such a way that here I have E0, here I have E1 and E2 that do not intersect. Um, and I guess in terms of lines, it looks like this. And one example, one element of V2 is 
Well, we got x by blowing up eight points. Um, so if you take two of the points and you look at the exceptional divisors, the exceptional curves over them, and the line that goes through the two points, you know, the strict transform of it, that's exactly an example. Here's the two exceptional curves above these two points, and the line through it intersects both of them. Uh, with the strict transform of the line through it intersects both these exceptional curves. Um, and V3 um, is just the set of two lines that do intersect each other. So in terms of the graph, like that. So E0 and E1. Um, so here's just to show you the idea of some of these things. And this is not very deep, um, but it's nice to try to find some arguments that don't say just compute it. Um, so for instance, the first one is actually uh, also, this was already long known. It's basically, if you have one of these curves, you blow it down, you get it up as a surface of degree two, and you act transitively on the rest still. So this is part of what Manin already knew a long time ago. Um, and maybe he already knew the second one too, but um, it's a bit more special, so that's not written down like this, of course. Um, so there's already the, the proof of the first one, and it also gives you the number of elements in there. Namely, you have 240 of them, and um, 56 of the remaining 239 do not intersect um, this first one. Um, so now let's look at the argument for V2. Um, so I'm going to look at a map from V2 to V1, because I can just project. I have an E1, E0, E1, E2. I can just only remember E1 and E2. Um, and well, on V1, I already know that I'm acting transitively. So all the fibers are going to have the same number of elements. Um, so to find that number, all I need to do is look at one trip, one uh, pair. So I can just look at um, E1 and E2 that I get by taking them to be the two exceptional curves above two points. I just look at this intersection pairing, you get some uh, inequalities for the coefficients on, in terms of your basis, and it's pretty easy to show that you get um, exactly 72 elements um, in each fiber. So that shows that V2 um, has as many elements as V1 times 72. Um, but now, uh, the interesting thing happens. So, as I already said, one way to think about these three, uh, well, one element in V2 is this triple that you get by the two exceptional curves above two points that you blew up and the line through them. Um, and indeed, if you take that triple, so now fix that triple. So here it says, um, for one specific one, I didn't say which, but now I'm telling you which, take the two exceptional curves above uh, two points and the line through them. Now it's again pretty easy to see that um, I'm going to look at all the elements, all the, other, all the minus one curves that intersect all three of these with multiplicity zero. And it turns out there's only six of them. You already knew there had to be at least six because they're the other six exceptional curves above the other six points that you blew up. But those are the only ones. Um, and they intersect each other with multiplicity zero. So now the stabilizer of this one element, that, uh, this one triple that I chose, the stabilizer is going to act on this set of six elements because those elements are just defined in terms of the intersection numbers with these three. So the stabilizer maps to S6, namely the, uh, the permutation group on these six elements. Um, but I'm claiming that that map is injective because if I fix not only E1 and E2, but also those other six, then I fixed eight elements that have uh, with each other all intersection multiplicity zero. So that means that because I'm 
uh, acting freely on the big uh, set U that I had before, that, um, that any element in the kernel of that map from uh, the stabilizer to the permutation group of that set of six elements, um, the kernel of that map is zero. So that means that the stabilizer of this triple has size at most six factorial, so 720. And that means that the orbit of this one specific element that I chose, well, its number of elements is exactly the size of the group divided by the number of elements in the stabilizer. So that's at least the number of elements in the group divided by 720. And now you'll just have to believe me um, that that's exactly the number of elements in V2. So that means that indeed the orbit is the whole thing. Um, if you don't believe me, there's enough numbers that you can figure it out by now. Um, so indeed, it's also transitive. The action is also transitive on V2. Um, so let's go to V3 um, and have a similar, um, a similar argument, except here that I went from V, I had a map from V2 to V1, and I already knew that I was acting transitively on the codomain V1. Now I'm going to map V2 to V3, and I know that I act transitively on the domain. Well, then I also act transitively on the image, and I want to show that the image is the whole thing. But if I act transitively on the image, then at least the non-empty fibers all have the same size. So now again, I compute the size of one non-empty fiber. It turns out that that has size 32. Um, and then, well, now what is the size um, of the image then? The size of the image, it's the number of elements in V2 divided by the number of elements in the fiber. And that turns out to be exactly the number of elements in V3, because what is V3? That's 240. Each one of them um, intersects um, exactly 126. We'd seen in that picture elements with multiplicity one. Um, so rho is indeed subjective. And that means that G also acts transitively on V3. So this is a type of arguments that show you all kinds of um, transitive actions on all kinds of subsets. Um, the corollary is that um, if I have any such triple in V2, of which I just said, well, one example is that the, the, the two, trend, uh, two exceptional curves above the two points and the, line, the trans, uh, strict transform of the line through them, um, now it turns out that you can describe all of them like that. Because um, if you have any triple, then there's another blowdown under which that is exactly the description of that triple. Because what do you do? That triple, well, there is a, um, an automorphism that sends it to the triple of the description that I just had. And if you apply the inverse exactly to the eight exceptional curves, then you get eight exceptional curves that still don't intersect each other at all. And you can blow those down. And then with respect to it, the one triple that you had has exactly the same description. So um, that type of argument will come back later, too. Um, and actually, here's the proof that I just told you, so I can skip that. Um, now, it turns out. If you do more of these arguments, so for instance, the action on triples of lines that all intersect each other with multiplicity one, that's also transitive. If you look at quadruples of lines that all intersect each other with multiplicity one, it's no longer transitive, but there's two orbits. And a small orbit and a large orbit and a large orbit contains quadruples that extend very nicely to very large um, complete subgraphs, and you can even show that those are maximal. Um, so you can show that the maximal, uh, the, the largest, yeah, so when I talk about maximal cliques or maximal complete subgraphs, I have to be careful, of course. Either it means that they're not contained in a bigger one, and they're maximal in that sense, or they have maximal size. Um, and I will use both. 
Um, anyway, the maximal size of complete subgraphs is 16. As for the pets of service of degree three and two, you might think that the story ends there because for those, um, the maximum was actually attained also. And here it's also attained, but only in characteristic two. So here's an example, um, just to show you that you can actually write this down and it can be very explicit, but of course, who cares? But if you take these eight points in P2, of course you need to do it over uh, an extension of F2 because there's not enough points over F2, let alone ones that are in general position. Um, if you take these, um, these eight points, then the following curves actually all go through this one point P, uh, namely the four lines through two of the points, but also four specific cubics and another four cubics, oh no, so, uh, hmm? yeah, I guess so. Four lines, four cubics, another four cubics, and four quintics. And in fact, these 16 consist of eight partnered pairs. Because of course, if you have a maximal number of minus one curves going through a point, if there's any partnered pairs, that means that the point lies on the ramification curve. But then if you have any other curve going through it, you might as well throw in its partner also. So the maximum is going to consist of a bunch of partnered pairs, where the partnered pairs were these ones that you have, that they're the two components of the pullbacks of these intersection with tritangent planes. Um, and indeed, these, the, the partners of the four lines are the four quintics, and the partners of these four cubics are these four cubics. And if you want to check that indeed all 16 of them go through that point P, then you only need to check the four lines, the first four cubics, and one of the other eight, because as soon as one of the other eight also goes through it, that means that, well, you have a full pair in there, and if you had the first eight, then you also have the other eight going through the point. Um, okay, so that shows that in characteristic two is possible, but now the hard work actually begins. Um, outside characteristic two, in most characteristics, but here I'll just restrict to characteristic zero, um, in most characteristics, finally the statement of the lecture, the maximum is 10. So that means you have to do some work other than working with this graph um, to show that the 16 is not possible in general. Um, and well, one way you do this is you still, you dive more into the, the graph on these minus one curves to see what types of large complete subgraphs there are. Apparently there's the subgra complete subgraphs on 16 and in fact what it says here um, is that um, G, the automorphism group, acts transitively not only on the set of all complete subgraphs of size 16, but in fact, even on the set of six pairs that are contained in such a complete subgraph of 16. Um, and that means that if you're going to ever have a point on the ramification locus, with more than 10 lines going through it, well, if it's on the ramification locus, then the maximum number you're going to get by having partnered pairs going through it, if it's more than 10, you're going to need six pairs of minus one curves going through it. And if G acts transitively on all these things, then we've just seen, just as before, when I said, well, G was acting transitively on, on the V2, and that meant that you could see every element of V2 as the two exceptional curves and the special line from some blow up of P2 in eight points. Here also, that means that if we want to show that six partnered pairs cannot go through one point, all we need to do is to show that for one specific example of a description of, of six of those pairs. Um, 
And we just saw a description, at least in characteristic two, but the same description works everywhere. You just pick some of those and you show that somehow you show that they can't go through a point in characteristic zero and you'd be done for the case that P lies on the ramification locus. If P is off the ramification locus and you want to show that you cannot have more than 10 lines, 10 minus one curves going through it, then you need to understand the complete subgraphs of size 11 or bigger that do not contain a partnered pair. Because if you had a partnered pair in there, you'd be on the ramification locus. So here's these two statements. The first statement I just said already that was about, this is just a statement about the, the graph, namely any six partnered pairs form a complete subgraph are contained in a maximal clique of si like 16 and GX transitively on those things. Similarly, for the other case, any 11 lines that do not contain any partnered pairs and that form a complete subgraph, they are contained in one that's slightly larger, one of 12, and G acts transitively um, not only on the set of all complete subgraphs of size 12 that are that big, but also on the, the 11 in such s complete subgraphs. Um, and that means that, well, as I said, this is a statement about what remains to do for the two cases, we have two cases where P is off and where P is on the ramification locus. Um, and to show that for P on the ramification locus, to show that no six, six such pairs can go through a point on uh, the ramification locus, it suffices to do it for any description of six such pairs because any such six pairs will be of that description for some blow up. And the same if you want to show that no 11 um, can go through a point, no 11 without a partnered pairs uh, can go through a point outside the ramification locus. All you need to do is show it for, for one specific description. Now this slide um, contains what you have to do for P on the ramification curve, so that's with the, the six partnered pairs. And actually, just because of the time, let me skip that one, because, um, well, it just says that you can't with, so what you have to show is that if you have any eight points in general position and you take a description of six partnered pairs, and here's a description, you take as before in the characteristic two case, I guess I'm telling it anyway, um, you take four lines and, and four cubics. Yeah, so there's four lines. And then here's only three cubics because as soon as I have two cubics, that describes the four lines plus two cubics is already six elements, one of each um, pair. And then because I have an extra, so these two cubic curves, they actually form a partnered pair. So as soon as I have those two, I would also have the partners of the other ones. And you just show that these cannot go through a point. Um, what does that mean? With magma, you can say, okay, give me Here's the equations of what it means to s that all these seven curves go through one point. But here's the equations that say that they're not in general position. So just show that these equations imply those. If you have all those equations, they actually imply that you're not in general position. Now, in the other case, um, so, so that would show exactly what you want. Um, if you show this, um, you show that on the ramification curve, no more than ten, 10 lines can go through a point there. And the other case, I've shown it a little bit um, more, in a little bit more detail. So here's 10 curves. Um, and now, yeah, I still have six minutes, so this is probably going to be okay. So this proposition is ugly, and unfortunately, I still want you to remember it, so I'm going to write it down. Um, so the proposition says start with eight points in general position. So I have Q1 through Q8 in general position. And then I have, I was, go I said I was going to look at 11 curves, but actually 10 is enough. 
of course, if these 10 don't go through uh, a point, then the 11th that exists here will also not go through it. Um, and what are the lines? I'm going to want to remember that. Namely, I have a line where Q1 and Q2 are contained in L1, so that's a line. I also have a line where Q3 and Q4 are contained in L2, there's also a line. Um, then I have four conics, and that's contained in Q1, 3, 5, 6, and 7. Q1, 3, 5, 6, 7, they're all contained in C1, and that's a conic. Um, the next one, I'm going to write it a little bit more efficiently. It's 1, 4, 5, 6, and 8. They're in C2. These are all conics. Uh, so we also have a C3 and a C4. And this is 2, 3, 5, 7, 8. 2, 3, 5, 7, 8. And 2, 4, 6, 7, 8. Two, four, six, seven, eight, and I also have a whole bunch of quartics that I will not write down. There's also four quartics, and the statement is that if they're in general position, then these ten curves cannot go through um, the same point. There's no point that lies on all these curves, and. I want to give you a flavor of the proof of this, but before I do, let me tell you what the corollary is this. This would mean that, indeed, there is no point in X of the ramification locus that lies on more than 10 curves. And how does it follow from the proposition? Well, first, you show that those 10 curves, actually, there's a, an 11th one, such that all 11 form a set that intersect each other um, without any partner pairs. So then it's one of those subsets of size 11 that G acts transitively on. Um, so it's an element of the set of all of those 11 su subsets of size 11, and G acts transitively on the set of all such subsets. Um, and that means that if I have any 11, it's going to be, it's going to contain 10 that under some blowdown are of this description. So if the proposition says that these cannot go through one point, I'm done. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, well, as, bef as, as I said before, so I'm looking at nine points really, the eight points Q1 up to Q8 and P. And on the one hand, I have the subscheme gamma that says that these are not in general position. So that's a closed subscheme of P2 to the ninth. But I also have a closed subscheme that says that all these 10 curves do contain the point P. So what I want to do is I want to show that the variety delta is contained in gamma, meaning that as soon as you have uh, such a nine tuple of points where they do go through point, is actually not in general position. Now, because the automorphism group of P2 acts um, on everywhere, so PGL3 acts everywhere, I might as well first choose four points that I choose wherever I want them. Um, because this is way too many coordinates to actually do a computation with. Um, so I choose um, P, Q1, Q5, and Q6 fixed. And here's some configuration. And in this configuration that I drew, indeed, L1 and L2, they go through P. Those were the lines containing Q1, Q2, and Q3, Q4. Um, also, the conic C1 that goes through Q1, Q3, Q5, Q6, and Q7 goes through P. And Q2, you can check that exactly the ones that should be on there are on there. And here's another one. So I already have five of the curves going through P. Now the next one in this picture doesn't. It doesn't quite prove that it can't happen. Um, 
But what I want to do is, because this is too many equations, I want to, too many variables to actually do computations with, I want to make the computations a bit easier, and I claim that this subset, where at least these five curves, so the subset Y, where at least these five curves contain P, that that's birational to five copies, the product of five copies of this line that I take there. I take one line through Q5, and how am I going to get from five such curves to an element on that line? No, well, what I do is I take the intersection points of the line L2 and C1 and C2 with that line, and then I also draw the line through P and Q7, I intersect it with L, and I draw the line from P to Q8 and I intersect it with L. So now I get five points on L. And in fact, to show you that it's a birational map, I can also go the other way around. Because I had my four points that I chose wherever I wanted them, and now here's the line L1. Um, I know that lambda was the point that was lying on C1. So I have five points on C1, so that determines the conic. Also, the other conic is determined because I have four points and the intersection point with L. I have this line also, so that gives me Q3 and Q4. And I have that line, now that I have the conic, I can intersect that line with it and get Q7. I find Q8, and there was a third conic that is now also determined, and therefore also its intersection point with L1, Q2 is determined. So this is actually a birational map, and it means that now I can do my computations in L to the fifth. Um, and it turns out actually, if you were wondering why the coordinates were chosen in that way, it had three Greek letters and a T and a U, if you project on the Greek letters, um, then the sub-variety that shows you, uh, that tells you that also the fourth conic is in there, is now a sub-variety of L to the fifth. And that's actually a conic bundle with a section. So you can parameterize it, and now this you can all do either by hand or, or with magma, but then at least um, you end up with the scheme describing that six of the 10 curves go through P. That's described by a variety that's just birational to A4. And now those last four quartics, that describes a sub-variety of A4, but because the number of variables is now reduced enough, there you can show that indeed this lies in the sub-variety um, that tells you that you're actually not in general position. Um, and that's exactly where magma can at that point finally help you and um, then um, you show that you cannot have more than 10. And there is actually is an example where you do have 10, um, so the maximum is 10. Um, thank you, and sorry I went a few minutes over time.